so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Turn in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to read verses 18 through the end. Starting in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her in great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye already, that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, under the churches. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that right now you would uh, open up these scriptures to us and help us to understand these warnings that you're giving this church. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church uh, to be protected by you. Lord, I ask for your blessing and your provision. Lord, we ask for spiritual prosperity and growth in our church. Lord, as we read through these churches that have had problems and get correction, Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply these to ourselves as a group and to ourselves individually. Lord, I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit right now and give me the mind of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would help all those that are listening to be able to hear and to understand and apply your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Revelation chapter 2, we're seeing this church of Thyatira. Now, this church is known by this false prophetess, Jezebel, actually known by a woman. And Jezebel is a phrase that means daughter of Baal. Like she is literally a, a daughter or a child of Satan. And she was in this church te teaching doctrines of devils and causing the church to actually be separated and divided. And I think this is interesting because as we get closer to the end times, we're going to see many uh, big churches that will look like this perhaps where maybe you have a core that's saved but then you have uh, woman teachers you have women teaching things this these doctrines of devils the depths of satan causing division in god's churches listen there are many churches out there that may be a church in name only we know there are many false ones out there but the warning is not to let deceptive doctrine in and not to let uh, like especially a woman to lead them astray. Now listen, God loves men and women both, and we'll touch on that for a minute, but let's go ahead and take a look at the church, the admonition, uh, the, the rebuke, and of course uh, how he ends off this chapter. So let's start in verse number 18. And he says, And unto the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like firm brass, like I'm sorry, like fine brass. So he starts this off. Now notice we've seen several titles for the Lord already in this chapter. We saw in Revelation uh, 1 earlier, he says, I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the ending. In Revelation 1, he also says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has many titles in the book of Revelation, many titles and names and descriptions to help us understand who he is. So when he comes to Thyatira, one of the first things that he actually, he's kind of saying here is giving them this this uh, warning or this stern warning or a reminder 
of his authority. How many of you kids have ever been like, where maybe you do something you're not supposed to do and your mom has to come and tell you a second time and she's like, I'm your mother. You will obey me, right? Well, that's kind of what God is doing. He's saying, hey, I am the Son of God. I am the one that redeemed you. Pay attention to the words that I'm saying. You need to learn from this. So this is a very, uh, I think he's just trying to remind who's talking here and the importance and the authority with which he's speaking. Now, continuing in the next verse, verse number 19, he says, I know thy works. Listen, that ought to be a comforting thing. There are a lot of us that do a lot of little works here and there, and you think, well, nobody sees it. Well, God knows your works. But listen, there's a reward both here and there. There's also correction here for those that do the wrong works. But look how he addresses the whole body of the church. He says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. Now he says that twice. And the last to be more than the first. Now he starts with works, he ends with works, that's very interesting, but he also says, uh, and, and the last to be more than the first. He's trying to say that this church was successful in certain areas. There were uh, greater works that they were accomplishing, they were increasing over time, and uh, I want to address these four that he mentions here. What's he say? He says charity and service and faith and patience. These are good works that every church should have. And churches without charity, man, what a dead church. What a place not to be. What an angry church. So he starts with charity. He says, I know thy works and charity. Now, charity can be broken up into a few areas. Now, he's, uh, mind you, he's writing to the Christian. So Christian, how should the charity be demonstrated in your life? I think firstly, as a godly love. First, it's godly love, and then it's brotherly love, being long-suffering with your brother, and then, of course, having compassion on the lost, willing to preach the gospel unto them. So this church was known for their charity, and God uh, was proud of them for that. But then he says, service, next, and thy service. Now, sometimes we do service as works, where maybe we, uh, uh, those of you that clean the church or help in different areas in serving other people or taking care of things, you're really trying to serve God. You do it for God's glory. And sometimes we serve other people for the sake of God or for God's glory to make it easy for people uh, to receive uh, the word of God. But when he says service here, a verse that comes to mind in Romans 12 where he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now listen, you're supposed to sacrifice your body. So that means putting off your desire, your wants. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God expects of you to be willing to die to yourself, to die to yourself daily, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, choose to walk in the Spirit, and stop walking in the flesh. Every Christian should have some good service. They should be able to, uh, uh, it should be said that they are serving the Lord and doing service unto the Lord, which is holy, a living sacrifice unto the Lord. The next that he mentions here in verse 19 is faith. It's faith. Now, he's, he's writing to those that are already saved. Now, they're saved by faith, right? So when he says faith, he's saying, hey, add to your faith. He's saying, increase your faith. He's saying, learn to trust in God and have confidence in Him for all things. And this is often where we have difficulty, uh, you know, when, when you guys' vehicle was broke down. Somebody was obviously praying because it was like, well, we have to call a tow truck. We need a ride. Somebody had enough faith to say, well, God, you're bigger than a problem with a vehicle. Let's pray and ask for you to solve this problem. And they did it, didn't they? Listen, the Lord knows how to use people. And it's our job to be faithful in service, in charity, and to have great confidence in Him. The last one he mentions here is patience. Patience. That means uh, waning. Patience is a virtue, right? Patience is difficult at times. Uh, oftentimes in the flesh, we are impatient. We want it now. It's instant gratification. It's microwave TV dinner generation, you know? Well, God says we need patience. And this church had it, and he was proud of them for being patient. Uh, in James 1, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect, and entire wanting nothing 
God's will for you is that you would learn to perfect your patience, that you would be a, a, a grown-up Christian by being patient. So you mean, that means when you're going through a storm, you're patient for when God, God gets you out of the storm and not just giving up and saying, this is too much, I can't bear it. That's learning to trust in the Lord and being patient in difficult times. So in that verse, he has those works that he names, the charity, the service, the faith, and the patience. That's the one thing he brags on this church for. But then he kind of turns the table. So he says, everybody's doing a good job on these four things. However, we have a problem and it needs to be dealt with, right? So look at verse number 20, Revelation 2, 20. He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now this is, I believe, the main theme of this church because this is the reputation that they had was that they had a leader, a so-called prophetess named Jezebel that had a reputation of teaching heresy. Jezebel means uh, daughter of Baal, if you will, or wife of Baal. She was obviously, uh, I believe, an infiltrator, a false prophet, and there to subvert souls. And it says there that God had something against them. What was it? Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel to teach. That's a strong word. In fact, we see something similar in 1 Timothy 2. He says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Listen, God loves women. He's not trying to suppress women. He's not trying to make make it uh, impossible for them. Uh, God is not happy with people or churches that say that women are less class human beings or they should be treated like property or things like that. God loves women and he sees the value of their soul. Very great. But he also has given them a different mindset and different gifts. Your Women are a different person. You ladies out there need to understand that you are to learn in silence with all subjection. God would have you to have a husband to lead you and teach you and guide you. And you know what? He's responsible for all the hard stuff. Now I say that, you know, hey, he's got to go to work. He's got to take care of the bills. He's got to make ends meet. He's got to love you and comfort you and protect you. Now, ladies, have you have your own uh, uh, hard work. Don't get me wrong. I believe women and child rearing and child bearing perhaps work harder than most men ever work in their entire life. And I have a lot of respect for women that choose to stay at home. I believe that is the most honorable thing that a lady can do is to stay at home and take care of children and not be worried about going out all over into the world and doing everything they want to do and getting a career. That's not God's will for your life. In fact, if you remember in Genesis chapter 3, when God had uh, judged after they ate the fruit, and of course, you know, they played the blame game. And then when it came to the woman, he said that um, she would have to bear children. And he said also that uh, her desire would be under her husband. This is the programming that's in your flesh. This is natural programming to desire to have a husband. And that's how God made you. It's a natural thing. So uh, when you ladies think about that, you need to understand, okay, Lord, help me to take what you've given me, what you've made me to desire, and to make it a righteous thing and make it uh, according to your word and make it uh, not with usurping the authority of a husband. That's God's will. In fact, in Ephesians 5, he says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now it goes on, men are, of course, required, commanded to forgive their wives and to love their wives and to comfort them. And, uh, you know, I've seen men that quote these verses and ignore the other. That's not right. You ladies have uh, the right, according to God, to be loved and cherished and honored and to give all the resources that you need to raise a godly family. Well, here in Thyatira, things were wrong. Also in Genesis 3, if you remember, that Adam was judged because he hearkened unto the voice of his wife. Didn't Job's wife kind of do the same thing? You know, he tried to talk Job out of the blessing. And he said, hey, you speak as a foolish woman. He said, no, I, shall we not receive uh, good and evil at the hand of the Lord? Some days are going to be good. Some days will be bad. It all comes from the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We have an opportunity to serve. Yeah, but it's a bad day. It's terrible. It's rainy and things are going wrong. Hey, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, Adam sinned because he hearkened to the voice of his wife instead of leading her. And he was corrected for that. 
So in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, when we see where this woman Jezebel, they suffered her. It was a suffering. They, they may not have saw it that way. They thought they were probably compassionate or I don't know the whole situation, but what details it gives us is that. In fact, let's read this verse one more time. Revelation 2, 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. There's a lot in this verse. She's teaching doctrines of devils. She's teaching to do the things that God clearly said not to do. Uh, adultery and fellowship with devils. Notice it's that she's a self-pronounced prophetess. I am the woman of God around here. She's saying, no, I am a prophetess. God's given me the power to speak. You listen to me. I've got a word from God. Boy, this reminds me of like the Pentecostal churches, right? How many women pastors out there? They're totally apostate. Every woman preacher I've ever seen has a false gospel. If I'm wrong, send it to me. But I've never seen a woman pastor leading a church that taught faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ without works for salvation. They all have something extra that they're adding because they're teaching doctrines of devils. This is the doctrine of Jezebel. This is that spirit of Jezebel, a woman that would intentionally usurp the authority and disrupt a church to try to cause problems. Paula White, she is a daughter of the devil. Victoria Osteen, same thing, a daughter of the devil. Uh, and the Oprah has her own little religion. And Joyce Meyer, same thing, a daughter of the devil. She wants the pride. She wants the preeminence. She's trying to usurp God's authority and man's authority. God is not happy with that. And although they may, may be prosperous on the earth, they do have a judgment coming. And I would warn any Christian that listens to any of them, hey, rebuke people that listen to them and warn them of the error of their way. And notice what else it says in verse 20. He, it says, to teach and to seduce. Now this is interesting. So what is this woman teaching, right? She's getting up and teaching, it is okay to live in fornication. God said, uh, one woman, man, one wife, get married forever, so choose wisely who you get married to and stay with them. She's teaching, hey, shack up, have boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, you know, take, take your marriage for a test drive, I don't know what, you know, but she's teaching that. But there's an extra word there, and to seduce. She's teaching them, and she is seducing Christians in the church to commit adultery with her. So she's going to the next level. It's something she wants for her desire, for her power, for her pleasure, and she's also teaching the, the pair doctrine is, well, God doesn't care who you uh, have that relationship. It can be anybody. Notice in, in verse 22, it says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her. So she's not just saying it's okay to live in fornication. She's saying, come and commit adultery with me. This is great heresy. And God is warning this church that he will destroy this church for this wicked Jezebel doctrine. Now I want to see who the original Jezebel is. We'll just take a glance at her introduction. Go to 1 Kings chapter 16. Go to 1 Kings in the Old Testament, chapter 16. And we'll see who is Jezebel. Because so there's a mixed opinion in the New Testament. Are we dealing with a name or a title? Uh, I, I believe it could be both. It doesn't really matter. It's irrelevant what your opinion is. We know what the name means. That it literally means the daughter or wife of the devil, of Baal himself. And there were many wicked women in the Bible that you could say had that same doctrine of Jezebel. They may not have carried her name, but they certainly had the doctrine of Jezebel. Delilah is one that comes to mind. She was a wicked uh, seduceress. She was uh, she she uh, ended up killing basically, if you will, or enslaving Samson, and she was working for the devil. Another woman that was in error was the the witch of Endor. She's literally working for the devil. Uh, another was uh, I think about Gomar. This is an interesting one. You think about Hosea. He took a wife of whoredom. Her name was Gomer, and uh, she went and and basically played the whore against him, and he had to go get her back and everything. I think about Lot's wife. Uh, uh, there's no evidence that she saved, but we see that she well, she disobeyed, and she turned in her heart. Uh, you know, she was uh, turned into a pillar of salt. 
In other words, Potiphar's wife, another evil woman that had the doctrine of Jezebel, which was adultery. Take what you want. Get what you want. You know, she was trying to be the boss and she tried to take Joseph. And when he rejected her, she had him. She tried to have him killed. He ended up being uh, locked up. Herodias, another one. Herodias, the wife, uh, well, second wife, I guess. Uh, Herodias was married to Philip and their daughter, uh, he calls, sh she caused her daughter to dance for Herod because she was acting as Herod's wife in a very inappropriate way. Now listen, this spirit of Jezebel infects a lot of these bad religions. We spoke a little bit this morning about some of that, how the false gods of the world, uh, they always want to, to use the women as witches and adulteresses to seduce God's people. That has been the devil's technique many times in the scriptures, and it's a reality today. There's a warning of it today. And listen, young ladies, be a lady. Don't let that spirit or seduction or desire overtake you and you become victim to that spirit or doctrine of Jezebel. You're in 1 Kings chapter 16. Look at verse number 30. 1 Kings 16, look at verse number 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now Ahab, as the king, boy, this is bad. He did evil above all. What a statement. He continues in verse 31. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. This is a warning. Now Ahab was supposed to be a child of God, and he marries a woman. Her father bears the name Baal. She bears the name Baal. He was a king, and he was probably also a priest of Baal. And, you know, sometimes you wonder, well, I wonder what my wife will be like. Well, look at the parents, because a lot of times the parents are the ones leading them and guiding them. Uh, look, you know, you think about Jezebel. She'd be the type of woman, you mean, it's like, whoa, something seriously wrong in that house. Well, when her father's raised worshiping the devil and doing human sacrifices and blood sacrifices and all those wicked deeds, what do you think these children think about God as they're grown up? What do you think their perspective is of honesty and purity righteousness and truth those are things that they reject listen parents that love their children are going to uh, try their best to not be a hypocrite in front of their child you want to raise your child to do the best they can in the sight of the lord we love the lord so we keep his commandments but you know what we fear the lord and we obey his law because we don't want his correction on our life jezebel and ethbel were people that didn't believe that they believed do whatever you want and it's acceptable look at verse 32 and he, this is Ahab, reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Here's the influence of marrying somebody that's a daughter of Baal. Well, next thing you know, you're going to build a house for him and honor him. Sounds a lot like Solomon, what he did later in his life. Look at verse 33. He says, and Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Boy, he really summed it up. He took the cake. He went farther than anybody else had gone. He did worse things than anybody else. And this is shameful. He's destroying his own house. He's destroying his own kingdom. All because of the influence of his wife. He took to wife a woman that did not love the Lord. Look at verse 34. In his days did Hiel the Bethelite build Jericho, and he laid the foundation thereof. And Abiram his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof. And his youngest son, Segub, According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Go ahead and go back to Revelation 2. But that, that last verse just kind of shows the, the arrogance of the time against the Lord. God had clearly said in Joshua, I believe it was chapter 6, that uh, not to rebuild Jericho. If you do, your firstborn will die. In this time, it was a time of rebellion. Every man was their own judge. They did whatever they want. They weren't respecting the Lord. They weren't afraid of the Lord. And so, of course, God's blessing was taken off of them. He began to correct them for the error of their way. Uh, as we see more about uh, uh, Jezebel in the Old Testament, we won't cover much, we won't cover any more tonight, but she killed many of God's prophets. She killed many. Now, she was ultimately judged, of course, but, uh, you know, when it happened, it, it was Jehu that basically 
had them throw her down. If you remember the story, she was up on a wall. She falls down. It says the blood sprinkled on the wall. And then Jehu came and rode over here with a horse. He goes inside. Hours later, he comes back and it says all they found was her skull, her palms, and her feet. And I mean, that's, I know this is graphic detail, but this is the Bible. What does God think of somebody like that? That they should just be ran over with a horse and eaten by dogs was her end because, uh, you know, she was serving a false god. She was teaching rebellion and fornication and witchcraft. And I think in the end times, we're going to see a lot of churches that will have this same doctrine of Jezebel. We'll see a lot of churches like Thyatira where there may be some good in it, but then there's also a lot of heresy and error. And one thing to consider though, as evil as Ahab was, he was a, uh, an evil man. He did many things to provoke the anger of the Lord as we just saw. Jezebel was even worse. God still gave him a chance to repent. God is very long-suffering. God is love. Let me read this verse and just listen to it. Uh, this is when he was rebuked. It said, Seest thou how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. As bad as Ahab was, God appreciated his humility in humbling himself when he was rebuked of the Lord. This is such a lesson for us as Christians to learn. Listen, when you're in error, when you're going in the wrong direction, your attitude should be such that you would say, Lord, I just want to be, I want to be correct in your eyes. I, I want to be working for you and doing things for you instead of myself. When Ahab humbled himself and the Lord uh, stayed his punishment, he did the same thing for the Ninevites. God's not a respecter of persons, but here, God obviously respects humility and honesty and repentance when you're, when you're confronted with the error of your way. Now, let's continue. Look at verse 21 because we see this, that she's a false prophet, this Jezebel in Revelation 2, and God gave her a chance to fix it, right? Look at verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Notice that she's a false prophet. I don't think she's even saved, but, but God gave her a chance. God gave the people in the church a chance. He gave them a firm rebuke, a warning, don't do it, you better fix it. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to kill you. I'll put you in tribulation. First, he says, except they repent of their deeds. The men in the church had a chance not to be judged for their sins, but they went through tribulation. Look what he says in verse 23. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. God's warning here. Just look at that verse for a second. I, I search the rain and the hearts. I will give you according to your works. He says, what was her works? Well, she was raising children uh, to be evil, to be wicked, to be adulterers and fornicators and to worship things and to eat things sacrificed to idols. That's another God. Could you imagine in a church people literally having another God, a statue, some pagan thing that we observe and we say, well, of course there's Jehovah, but then there's also Baal and we can have both of them. Can you imagine the anger of God, the jealousy as he looks down at a church that was, allow, that was allowing this, this woman was leading them astray, they were worshiping Baal and committing fornication and adultery. God says, I'm going to kill her, I'm going to kill her children, and all everybody else in the church that doesn't get it right. I want all the other churches to know, look what he says again in verse 23, that I am he which searcheth the reins in the hearts. Right? Listen, the Word of God is a judge of your thoughts and the intents, or the intentions of your heart. God knows what you're thinking. He says, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Earlier in the chapter, he praised them for their works. And now here he's warning them about their works. I will give you according to your works. The attitude of a Christian ought to be to repent quickly, to get the sin out of their life to be willing to change whatever is in their life that's preventing you to serve the Lord with the rest of your days on this earth. And again, this is kind of a, a group punishment for these group works that they allow. The whole group uh, was coming under this punishment, allowing these things into the church. Look at verse 24. But unto you 
I say, listen to this, and unto the rest in Thyatira. Look, think about that. So he said, listen, you guys are doing good on these things as a whole. You have a problem with this woman and her crowd. And then to the rest. He's saying to everybody else, this church was obviously divided. And he says, and to you guys that are not involved with her. He says, but I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put none, I will put upon you none other burden. He's saying, he's saying, continue in those good works, and I'm not going to put a burden on you. I won't put you through tribulation. I'm not going to kill you because you're not committing adultery and fornication inside of the church. You're not worshiping a strange God. Some people in the church were doing right. Others were suffering and going through it. This church had a lot of problems. They were divided. Doctrines of devils were being taught by the leadership, by the false prophetess. And he tells the rest. He says to the rest in Thyatira, right? Who's that? Those that have not known the depths of Satan. Look at verse 25. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. I'm not going to put a burden on you of any more works. I'm not going to make you jump through any hoops. I'm not asking you to repent of everything because you're doing well. He says, but hold fast what you have until I come. Listen, that's the message to the Christian. You're in a church. You're serving the Lord. You're doing the best you can to grow by reading the Bible and raising children and, and pleasing the Lord. He says, hold fast what you have. Don't let go. Don't let somebody else talk you out of your blessing. Don't give up on the Christian life and throw in the towel. He says, hold fast till I come. You understand, He will give us according to our works, both here on the earth and in eternity. And we have great things to look forward to in eternity. And God's saying, don't give up. Even when you're the minority, don't give up. Keep serving God. And listen, this is important because as Christians, we don't follow a man. We're not following some individual leader or even a woman like them, right? We serve Christ and we seek first His kingdom and everything else He'll take care of. Continue in verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Look at this. Now, who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Right? We see that in 1 John 5. We've overcame the world by how? Even our faith. We're saved by faith. Now that you have overcome, you are saved. Add to that what's he say? And keepeth my works unto the end. You know how hard it is to keep works to the end? You know, I mentioned Jehu earlier. He's the one that basically killed Jezebel. And you know what he did at the end of his life? He didn't take out the high places. He failed as a leader. He did a great job. He served the Lord. And then he went back to his old ways. There are many men in the Bible. Solomon, another one. Solomon had the best blessings from God on a nation, on a kingdom. He had great promises from God for provision and wisdom. And at the end of his life, he's building houses for false gods and serving them in the groves. He's allowing his pagan wives that stole his heart to cause, I mean, child sacrifice and everything else. This breaks my heart when you think about it. There are many examples in the Bible where people failed. We as Christians need to listen. Listen, hey, hold fast till he comes, right? What's he say? Keep my works unto the end. Yeah, and then what? What if I do that? What if I work real hard to stay working where God has me? Where He says, to Him will I give power over the nations. I want you to think about this. God has uh, a great kingdom coming on the earth where He will rule and reign with a rod of iron. This is a future spiritual resurrected kingdom where He will demonstrate His power and His glory and we will be victorious along with Him. In Revelation 1.6, he, he hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. Right? He hath made us kings and priests. Right, He says, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. When you look at Revelation 2, and he says, keep my works unto the end, and to him will I give power over the nations. Listen, there are Christians, when they get into eternity, they will not have uh, I, I, like stature in the Lord's army, if you will, because they're not keeping his works until the end. They give up. In Revelation 5, he says, hath made us kings, hath made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. There's a literal physical reign on the earth after the Lord comes, after the resurrection, and we will be part of that. And again, you're looking at Revelation 2. Look at verse 26. He says, if you keep my works to the end, he says, to him will I give power over the nations. God wants you to rule and reign 
in this spiritual kingdom one day. Revelation 20, he says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is a literal power over the nations that God wants to give to us. And that will sort of be his reward. Listen, we're not saved by our works, but he says, once you are saved, if you keep my works, hold on to what you have, obey my law, I will give you power over the nations. If you keep working for me, I will reward you in eternity. Again, read verse 26. He says, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter Shall they be broken into shivers, even as I received of my Father? Now, what kind of power will He give us? Listen, the, the sinful nations will be judged. God will cast them out that offend. Verse 28, And I will give Him the morning star. Who's He going to give the morning star? You understand, this is a reference to Christ. Uh, in Revelation 22, He says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give every man according to his works as it shall be. He says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. He says, now this is Jesus. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. You think about our earth. If you would go to Malachi chapter 4, and we'll finish with this. Go to Malachi chapter 4. That's the last chapter in the Old Testament. So if you can find Matthew, just take a few steps back. Malachi chapter 4. So when Jesus is teaching here, the Son of God says, keep my works unto the end. And I'll give you power over the nations, right? We're going to rule them with a rod of iron. I'll give you the morning star. Christ himself will be our leader. We will follow him. Of course, he ends out that letter by saying, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto churches. He says, Any Christian that has an ear, if you're in a church, pay attention, learn from their mistakes, and don't make the same mistakes. Learn from what God blessed them for, and do the same thing. This is very important. Now, you're in Malachi 4. Look at verse number 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be as stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings." And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. These verses, I want to meditate on it for just a second. I've used the example several times, but look what he's saying. S-U-N of righteousness. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the S-O-N of God. But one day he will come to the earth, and he says in verse 1, The day cometh that it shall burn as an oven. One day the, earth, the Lord will come and he will scorch those that do wickedly. They'll be as dry stubble. He will burn them up, he says in verse 1. They won't have a root or branch. He's going to destroy them completely. But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Listen, you guys that are, that are starting gardens, that are planting seeds right now, you got these little sprouts starting to come up, right? And you know what they need? The sun. The sun will give them life, and they will grow up like calves in a stall. Look at verse 3. And ye, now listen, that's us in our resurrected state. God will give us the judgment and the authority and the power over nations to rule with him with a rod of iron. He says, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. One day we're going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. He will give us power over the nations. And right now as Christians, maybe sometimes uh, you look at the uh, organized religion and the banking system and the politicians and you say, what can we do against them? It's, it's not fair. They've got so much power in a, a stranglehold. They're, they're, they're uh, putting media and information out there that's a lie and they're deceiving people and they're lying against God and against creation and about the Bible and they have such power against us. Maybe you say, well, it's not fair. They're too big. But you know what's going to happen one day? They're going to be scorched. We will rule with Christ with a rod of iron. These people that hate God and want to destroy Christians, one day we will be resurrected and judge them. And I'm sure they'll say, it's not fair. We're cast in hell forever. No, it is fair. They know what we're doing. 
They know what they're doing. And you think about it, when we struggle and we have trials and temptations, we have to remember, but this is just for a short time. Our time on earth is but for a minute. It's a drop in the bucket. One day we'll rule and reign with him for eternity. Literally millions and millions of years. The warning to Thyatira was not to let evil doctrine or doctrines of devils to overtake you. Right? And what if I'm rebuked? What if I have wrong doctrine? What should I do? Well, you should repent. You should give God the glory. Right? Uh, remember, he said he will give to them according to their works. And his last thing he said was, and unto the rest, what's he say? Hold fast till I come. Don't give up. Hold on. Keep working. Keep fighting. He'll give us power over the nations. You know, the end times church is probably going to be discouraged, disheartened, a minority. They're going to be attacked on every front. They'll probably be discredited and uh, some even probably killed. But you know what? God is bigger than that. And one day we will rule with him. Let's keep that in mind. We have something in eternity to look forward to. And for that cause and for that sake, don't give up. Hold fast till I come. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the lessons we can learn from this church. Lord, we love you and we're so thankful for everything you've given us. I pray you bless the rest of our time together tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.